Awesome. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, where we're going to kick off today is, uh, you don't have to think it's exciting, but I do. I'm, I'm just so jazzed. We're going to be diving right on into the doctor's opinion. Woo! Pew, 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 pew! Now, I will uh, just share with you guys the doctor's opinion. It's XXV. Uh, we're still in the Roman numerals where it's tricky to figure out what page we're on, but we're in the doctor's opinion first page. And I don't know about you, but when I got here, I really didn't care about what doctor's opinion was. You know what I mean? Like, who cares about that? But there are a lot of people who do come and want to hear about like, hey, is this whole thing medically sound? What do men of medicine and science, what do these sort of people think about, about this whole 12 step idea? Now, I will say I uh, never been a doctor, but I did write a couple of my own prescriptions a time or two. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, right? It's like, what's the, the and I'm just, I'm going to make that very old joke. What's the difference between God and a doctor? God doesn't think he's a doctor. And it's like, oh, oh, that, oh, that applies to me when I am in self will. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not throwing shade on the, on those in the medical uh, community. So the doctor's opinion is essentially going to be two statements that are written uh, or uh, yeah, two statements from Dr. William D. Silkworth. And we're going to talk about why we care, why we care about his opinion in particular, and and yeah, like what, what's going on here? So uh, is there anything you wanted to say to pr uh, prelude the uh, reading or are we diving in? No, let's rock and roll. Rock and roll, pew pew, all right. So the doctor's opinion, we of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm gonna say, so I'm gonna kick it off with something controversial, not all the way controversial, because I still need you to like me, uh, but a little bit controversial. So the original we, whenever we see the we of Alcoholics Anonymous in this book, that original we was referencing the first 180, 80 members of Alcoholics Anonymous. That is who they were talking about with the we. But my belief, and listen, this is my opinion, and I'm not a doctor, so feel free to disregard it. Uh, but my opinion is the more of us that do this work, follow these directions that are outlined in this book and experience what this book is talking about, the more of us that are included in so many of the we's that are referenced. So it's a little controversial. And I want you to know if you're like, ooh, page gross, you're wrong, you smell bad, that might be true. Uh, but, uh, you're right. You're right. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's cool. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be over here being wrong. Join Terry. He's on team right. I'll be over here being wrong. Pew, pew. All righty. So we of Alcoholics Anonymous believe that the reader will be interested in the medical estimate of the plan of recovery described in this book. And I want to point something out. This book contains a plan of recovery, a plan for me to get well, a plan for me to come from that place of hopelessness to that place of hope. And what it's saying is like the reader is going to be interested to say like, okay, what do the smarty pants with the white robes think about this? You know, what do these smart people think? So it says convincing testimony. And one of the things that I love about that word testimony, when we talk about testimony, what we're talking about is experience. Even though this is the doctor's opinion, the testimony is based off experience, not ideas, not opinions, not what all the cool kids are doing, but experience. So even Dr. Silkworth, who is not an alcoholic, not an addict, but came into contact with a lot of us, his opinion is based out of experience. So convincing testimony must surely come from medical men who have had, and here's that word again, experience with the suffering of our members and have witnessed our return to health. So a doctor who has had experience with this illness, but also experience with watching what happens when we follow these directions, seeing the solution, the spiritual awakening as it, as it awakens in our lives. So a well-known doctor, and if you're writing in your book, and why wouldn't you? I hear it's what all the cool kids are doing, and that never got us in trouble before. Uh, I hear the boys won't like you if you don't write in your book. Uh, and all the girls are going to say you're going to smell bad if you don't write your book. I'm just going to do uh, childhood uh, bullying and teasing, but you also don't have to write in your book. All of this is consensual. <laughs> um, but if you're writing in your book, when it says a well-known doctor, you can write Dr. Silkworth, because that is who we're talking about, Dr. Silkworth. 
a well-known doctor, and it says chief physician. To be the chief physician is to be the top doctor. He's the boss doctor. He's the guy in charge. Doctor living large in charge, telling them what to do. So at a nationally prominent hospital. And if you're interested in the who's who and where's where and what's what and the fun facts, uh, you can make a little note that the hospital is the Towns Hospital in New York City. And this was a hospital and it was just right across the street from Central Park. So you can kind of tell that they, you know, they had some, they had some real estate, you know, oh, that is some New York real estate, but it was not a general hospital. Oh, I just, it just clicked to me why uh, general hospital would be called general, general hospital. I just had that little epiphany. Um, it was not a general hospital. Uh, and I don't know, there might have been like drama like you would see on Grey's Anatomy. I actually, if it would help you get interested in the history of Alcoholics Anonymous, absolutely. Dr. Silkworth, he had a McDreamy and a McSteamy and they worked together. Don't let Howard, uh, don't let Howard uh, tell you otherwise, you know. Uh, there was absolutely the, that. Uh, but the Towns Hospital was a hospital that was dedicated to alcoholism and drug addiction. That's what its focus was. It was focusing on detoxing, getting people uh, a, a little bit of treatment. That's, and so this is a doctor that specialized in alcoholic, so a uh, nationally prominent hospital specializing in alcoholic and drug addiction gave Alcoholics Anonymous this letter. And so uh, why do we care? Well, I always like to make the joke, this, this is not a dermatologist who saw his aunt get a little too tipsy. You know what I'm saying? It, that's not what we're talking about. We're saying a doctor that worked with, now Bill, Bill said 50,000 different alcoholics, different drug addicts. Did he probably pump up the numbers? Yes, yes, probably, probably a bit. Uh, but heck, let's not get the truth, let the truth get in the way of a good story. So he, but he did work in his career. He oversaw hundreds of alcoholics and drug addicts thousands of alcoholics and drug addicts and oversaw their care. And so this is not a doctor that's got an opinion. This is a doctor that's got experience. And what we'll do is we'll dive into his letter, the first letter, the first statement to Alcoholics Anonymous. Is there anything you wanted to say about that, Terry? Yeah, you forgot the pew, pew, pew. Pew, 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 sorry. sorry. Pew, yeah, pew. I, I, can't, I can't speak without the pews. Yeah, good to be here. My name is Terry. I'm an alcoholic. And first things first, you know, when you tell someone to read the first 164 pages, that includes the doctor's opinion. If you ever read, if you ever looked at a first edition of Alcoholics Anonymous, it's a nice big red book. <laughs> and the first page, number one, says the doctor's opinion. So it has been changed over time. Howard, you could correct me on it. I don't know exactly the history of why they changed it. Was he not an alcoholic? I, I don't know. You could, you could, uh, Toss that in there for me. <clears throat> but first things first, I, I want to look at it. This is the top dog. This is a chief uh, physician. This, you know, say I have a toothache or say I, I have a root canal, right? And I, I want to go to my general dentist. They're like, yo, you need to go see a, a chief physician. You need to see a top dog. You need to go see someone that can handle a root canal. And this is a guy who sought out, I, I guess he observed thousands of alcoholics, hundreds of alcoholics, who knows, they did pump the numbers to make a statement. Yes, they did. But this was the guy to go talk to, right? And what is his, what is his opinion? You know, what, that's a question that's going to be kind of answered. There's going to be three doctors that they introduced, the, the book introduces to us. You know, the first one is Dr. Silky. Second one is uh, Dr. Carl Jung, right? And the third one is Percy Pollock, I believe. But yet again, Howard, you could correct me. Okay, yeah, I got a, yeah, I got a head bob. Yeah. <laughs> I, I struck out on the first one. I got good on this one. Yeah. But uh, what I like to do, and, I, and, and, and this is something that I love to do with anyone who I work with, is I like to stake statements and turn them into questions. Because uh, I could read this book like a romance novel. Who has read this book like a romance novel? I have. <laughs> right? it, this is a book that I'm meant to be studied and I want the book to talk personally to me in that first sentence like am I interested in the medical estimate of plan described in this book that's a question there put a question mark after that and ask am I interested in this book am I interested in the medical facts uh, about someone who specializes in seeing what not just alcoholic but drug addiction you're going to hear that again when he talks later on right so this book can help people who are both addicts 
and alcoholics. I'll say that one more time for all my tradition people. <laughs> I love those people. This is for alcoholics and for addicts, right? And what I mean, look, what's the difference between an alcoholic and addict? Uh, let's just say that they're, they're cousins, right? They're both animals, right? Uh, I might be a, 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 what is it called, a tiger, and someone might be a lion, right? You know, but I'm I'm an ant. I'm a liger, right? I'm both, right? You know, so we've got that it factor, right? And this book, this book, if you look at it as a book of mirrors, and you start to take statements and turn them into questions, the book will start start talking to you personally. I'm like, yeah, that's me. And then one thing I really want to point out is as I go through this, you could write this anywhere in your book. I hope you brought your pens. I brought my pen, actually. I haven't written in this book yet, so we're going to all write together, right? And I want to have an experience with this book. We can make it a study. We can make it a workshop. We can make it an experience that you haven't had before, right? And I want you guys to ask yourself, while we go through the first 43 pages of this book, including the doctor's opinion, and ask yourself, am I an alcoholic? You know, this is a consideration for everybody here. Am I an alcoholic? Or am I an addict? Or am I both? Or am I neither? Right? And this book will pinpoint it and find out exactly who you, what, what exactly did you sell your soul for? What did you have this physical, medical uh, phenomenon craving with? Right? It will knock it down. It will pinpoint it for you. Right? We'll talk about that later on in a few more pages. And it's extremely important because if you're someone who's just hanging out in AA and you're an addict and you know, it's just because you want to hang out with granddaddy, you know, everybody likes to hang out with granddaddy, right? And then AA has got some wonderful recovery, but you can't relate to the speakers talking about alcoholism, right? You are needed in a specific fellowship, right? You are needed in that specific fellowship. So if you go through this process with us, which I'll, I'll explain and Paige will explain, you will take the, this experience and you will bring it to the fellowship that, that you're designed fellowship and make it strong. Right, cocaine anonymous, drug addicts anonymous, gamblers anonymous, Al Anon, go make those fellowships strong. Right, they need you. Right, that, that's all I got. Pew pew pew. Back over to you. And uh, it's it's actually super helpful to have a little helper here because uh, I was like, oh man, I I have I have a copy of the book, uh, a replica. And the problem is, if it's over there, I can't easily get it. But we got it. Uh, and so what we see is on page one is the doctor's opinion in the replica first edition. And uh, because I'm talking about it now and my brain will go all over the place, I'll talk about, because you might be like, yeah, Terry mentioned it, it was on page one. And Paige, you're showing me in the first edition, it was on page one. Why was it moved? Why wouldn't it be on page one? The doctor's opinion is is crucial. Step one information. Why would we tuck those away in the Roman numerals that only the Keeners at a lunacy commission would be hanging out like, you know what I mean? Like, why would we move it there? Well, in, uh, in the uh, original first edition, what we will see is that uh, the, oh, you can't really see it that well. Howard has got like letters and stuff in the chat, so you'll be able to see it better in there. Uh, but you'll see that it is signed dot, 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 MD, like anonymous, anonymous MD, like an anonymous doctor. And so when, when it was the anonymous doctor who was writing that letter in literary convention, they could keep it Alcoholics Anonymous and all the authors are anonymous. But as soon as they put his name to the letters and put his name in the doctor's, uh, uh, opinion in literary convention. I know, come for the hopeless condition, stay as Paige explains, literary convention, fun. Who wouldn't want that on a Friday night? You know what I'm saying? But in literary convention, if you are in the numbered pages, you are considered an author. So as soon as they put his name to it, which they did uh, for to the, or, uh, in the second edition, it was after he died. They did that. So it didn't have that very alcoholic, like, I'm not going to ask permission. Yeah, off we go. Uh, and so, but it was added. And so they had to move it to the Roman numeral so it could still be like authored anonymously. So let's dive into that first letter, that first statement. It says, to whom it may concern, I have, to whom it may concern. 
I, and this is again Dr. Silkworth writing, I have specialized in the treatment of alcoholism for many years. And what this is, is known as an appeal to authority. So when you're trying to like propose an argument, and not how we do, which is flip a table, that's how we propose an argument. Uh, not anymore, we have recovered, we use our words. Uh, but you know that idea, like how we how we propose an argument. There's different ways. There's an appeal to logic, an appeal to emotion, and this is an appeal to an authority. So he's saying, "I'm an authority, like I'm an expert." That's what he's saying. So to whom it may concern, I have specialized in the treatment of alcoholism for many years. So no less than fifty thousand uh, alcoholics and drug addicts, or no more. Sorry, no more than fifty thousand alcoholics and drug addicts but probably a little bit less, not a lot less, a little bit less, right? So he is an expert. And it says in late 1934, I attended a patient who though he had been a competent business businessman of good earning capacity was an alcoholic of a type I had come to regard as hopeless. Make a note of hopeless because I want to find out if I'm hopeless. I need to know if I'm hopeless. And if you're writing in your book, you can make a little note that that is Bill Wilson, because I didn't know. I was like, who's this businessman, right? And so what, what's the point that he's trying to make? So the point that he's trying to make, as far as I can see it, is he's trying to say, like, here's a guy who, who was competent, who was functional. You know, he's kind of breaking that stigma that, like, an alcoholic is somebody. Man, I would come to meetings, uh, and people would say, like, oh, an alcoholic somebody that lives under a bridge. And I lived under a bridge and I was still like, I'm not like you guys, like I'm different. But like, he's trying to break the stigma and that denial that I have that, no, no, I'm a competent businessman. I've made a lot of money. I have a, I have a house and I have cars and I've got this and that. There's no way I can be an alcoholic. And he's like, here is this guy, Bill, who had it together, who, who had arrived. He had, he had it going on and still was an alcoholic and an alcoholic of the hopeless variety. And we're gonna we're gonna talk about that. Is there anything you wanted to say about that before we do some history? Yeah, pure, pure, pure. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, again, to whom it may concern, put a question mark after that. Am I someone who should be concerned? And again, we'll take these statements and turn them into questions. Make this book come alive and start talking to you personally. What's up, Phoenix? Hey, <laughs> all right. And 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 so check this out. He was a, a dude who was a competent businessman, right? Good earning capacity was the alcoholic of the type he had come to regard as hopeless. That's another statement. Was I hopeless? Question mark. Am I hopeless? And what is hopeless? It means I can't stay stopped. The inability to stay stopped. Actually, I don't, I don't know the actual definition. Paige, you got a definition on hopeless or what? 1932 dictionary and i will i will i'm sure i've looked it up and then promptly forgot but i'm gonna get out my 1930s dictionary oh yeah. anyone anyone here just excited it's a friday night Paige is talking about like <laughs> literary convention she's bringing up the dictionary <laughs> who doesn't love getting, being sober it's so much fun <laughs> <laughs> i can read if you want to if you want to take yeah, time yeah. to look it up if uh, yeah. if you take if you take the next one and then I'll, i'm gonna do some history stuff but yeah absolutely oh cool. cool. so in the course of his third treatment i got you beat bill i got six <laughs> he acquired certain ideas concerning a possible means of recovery, right? So steps one through 11. As part of his rehab or rehabilitation, he commenced to present his conceptions to other alcoholics. Step 12, impressing upon them, they must, there's that word must. Can you look up the defi 1930s definition of must? Absolutely, it's gonna there get a little go. musty. Yeah, it's gonna get a little musty up here to do likewise with still others. So here we go, here's another statement. All right, someone, Am I willing to impress my ideas and help other people, right? After I had this spiritual awakening, this become the basis. Basis, I've been looking at that word all throughout the book. 1930s definition of basis means an underlying support or foundation. Underlying support or foundation. So the underlying support or foundation of our growing fellowship of these men and their families. This man and over 100 others appear to have recovered. So there was is that witchcraft word again, recovered. <laughs> and I, I mean, look, man, recovering versus recovering. The book, if the big book, I said this earlier, the big book will define a word for you if you allow it to define a word for you. 
and it defines the word recovered as being recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. It means I've recovered. It means I've been it means I've been restored to usefulness. It means I've recovered from hopelessness. I'm no longer hopeless. I'm hopeful. This is a statement of hope. And when you read throughout the pages, I don't even I, I don't remember exactly how many times it says recovered. Howard, if you could jump in, maybe I think it's sixteen plus or something like that, right? I got I got how it working now. <laughs> but there we go. Like so I personally know scores, scores are just multiples or 20 of cases who were of the type with whom other methods had failed completely. Put a question mark after that. Have uh, have I tried other means to get sober? Has it failed completely? Right? Has that failed? Have other methods in my life failed completely? Has anyone tried smart recovery? Did that work? No, that, that failed me. Anyone tried to work a lot? That No, that failed me. Anyone tried to go to multiple rehabs before? That, that failed me too. Anyone tried switching from alcohol to cocaine? Yeah, that failed. <laughs> Actually, that put me down to my knees a lot faster than, it, than I anticipated. I mean, I mean, you ask yourself, have you tried other means to stop and were you were you successful? No, I was not. Yet again, we're taking these statements and turning them into questions to make this book talk to you personally. All right, Paige, back over to you, people, people. people. All right, so uh, for hopeless, oh man, I hold on, let me do must first because I got must right in front of me. So must, as it is obviously and intuitively, it is unfermented express grape juice. <laughs> That's literally the first one. Don't write that down. Don't write that down. That's uh, just the little dictionary you, haha that is actually you, the first definition but it says uh to be obliged morally or physically uh so that i must you know uh and then uh hopeless uh is without hope so again it's kind of we're defining it with the definition without hope having no expectation of good which is kind of funny because when we talk about hope and you spoke about the definition of hope is to have that expectation of good. So uh, it works together really well in the 1930s. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about like how this stuff came together. And when it talks about in the course of his third treatment, he acquired certain ideas concerning a possible means of recovery. So in that moment, Bill Wilson has the three pieces of information that I need to know in order to recover from my alcoholism or my addiction or my compulsive, whatever brings you to this study. Uh, and because we're here for shenanigans, I will do a little bit of screen share and just really, really, really quickly break down the history. And I'm gonna do it probably inaccurately, at which point uh, Howard has uh, free range to just put that in the chat. She's wrong and she sucks. Well, that's a little much. Uh, <laughs> uh, but all right, so Bill Wilson. And in, Bill, in Bill's story, we don't have to turn here. We don't have to go there. It talks about in the course of his third treatment. So in Bill's story, he talks about how he goes to the town's hospital on page seven. He goes there for the first time. And from, from Dr. Silkworth, he learns the physical allergy. He learns that once he starts to drink, he cannot stop. And we're going to talk about that probably not this week because of the pace we're going. Uh, but maybe next week or the week after. But he also learns that an alcoholic, the will, the will to not take that first drink is weakened. So he learns about the obsession of the mind. And that is what it means to, to have this illness, to have a physical allergy that once I start, I cannot stop. And when I say that is it, I do not want to do it again. It has no effect. And I find myself a day, a week, a month, several months down the line doing it again. The allergy and the obsession. And he learned that in the very, very first hospitalization. And then he leaves treatment. Anyone here ever leave treatment thinking they got the answer, right? And then he obviously does what we do, which he is that he relapses. And it's important to understand that if I have this illness, a relapse is inevitable for someone like me. And so he relapses. And then he goes back to the hospital. Now, in his story, he, he only does it one more time, but I guess historically he had two hospitalizations very quickly in there. But in that hospitalization, bottom of page seven, he's laying in his hospital bed and he overhears Dr. Silkworth telling Lois, his wife, that, listen, Lois, Bill is going to die of alcoholism. He is not going to make it through this thing. He is utterly hopeless. 
And Bill Wilson knows. He knows. They didn't even tell him. He overheard it. And he leaves the, he leaves the hospital the second time. And he is full of fear. Anyone here ever leave treatment full of fear? Ever have a harrowing relapse and be full of fear and try to stay sober on fear? But the inevitable happens. And he drinks again. And he's off on his relapse. And while he's on his relapse, his old buddy, his old drinking buddy, Eddie Throckmorton, that's his middle name. I just think it's fun. Throckmorton, Ebby Thatcher shows up. And Ebby Thatcher shows up and Ebby Thatcher is like, this guy's sober, this guy? You know, I kind of make the joke that Bill was like, man, if I ever get as bad as Ebby, I'll quit. You know, Ebby was bad. And he's like, he's sober? And Ebby Thatcher brings him the two missing pieces of information. So just really quickly, how it, how it ties together is uh, a little bit before. There was an incredibly rich man by the name of Roland Hazard. Roland Hazard, and he had alcoholism, and he was throwing money to see the best of the best of the best. So he, he wasn't going to drink again, and he could not stay sober. So he goes across, across the pond, across the ocean, over to Europe, and he goes to see Dr. Carl Jung, one of the most famous psychiatrists in the world. And he works intensively with Carl Jung, intensive treatment. Anyone here ever do an intensive treatment? Uh, and he, he finishes his treatment with unusual confidence. You'll see the story on page 26. Anyone leave treatment? Unusual. Anyone ever have that? This time's different. There's something, something about this time. It feels different, you know? And so he immediately relapses, because obviously, uh, and then he goes back and he's like, dude, what the heck? And um, Howard has transcripts where uh, it's uh, where it said, dude, what the heck? Uh, and then Carl Young said, my bad, homie. And Carl, uh, Howard's got all that information. He'll put it in the chat. <laughs> uh, that's how they yeah. talked back then. Yeah, yeah that's how they talked in the 1930s. Yeah. They're like, homie, what's up, my God? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's historically accurate. <laughs> And uh, he's like, what happened? Do you know how expensive you are? Carl Jung, you're hella expensive. Dude, that didn't fix me. And Carl Jung, again, he says, my bad. My bad, homie, I misdiagnosed you. You are an alcoholic and people like you don't get well. The only hope for somebody like you. So you're hopeless unless you can have is, is what I will call a vital spiritual experience, a spiritual awakening. And that in 12 steps is our solution. Our solution is a spiritual awakening. And Roland Hazard's like, ah, cool, man. I go to church. Heck yeah. And Carl Jung is like, well, that's great. That's great. Uh, but the odds of this thing happening to you are the odds of you getting struck by lightning. You can't hang out in a church pew and hope this happens. Like, it's great that you uh, have some sort of religious base or open to religion because the solution is spiritual. But man, you got to seek this thing because it's a one in a million. It would be miraculous for you to get it. And Roland Hazard, these are not good odds. He hears of this group. It's called the Oxford Group, and it was growing growing in popularity and it, it really was growing in Oxford University, which is how it got the name. And the Oxford group had nothing to do with alcoholism, nothing to do with drug addiction, but everything to do with having a deeper experience of God. And what they had was a course of action, a series of actions that any human being could take to have a deeper experience of God. And, Ro and Roland Hazard's like, oh, I need one of those. I'm gonna do that. And so it gets involved with the Oxford group. And the, that series of action later became what for us is our 12 steps. So that is our program of action. In Alcoholics Anonymous or in any 12-step fellowship, our solution is a spiritual awakening. And how we get that, how we achieve that, how we experience, how we get from hopeless to hope is our program of action, which today is our 12 steps. And Ebby Thatcher, um, being a completely reasonable, law-abiding alcoholic, uh, was uh, looking at his third strike uh, in Vermont. Uh, he was doing some drinking and driving, crashed into an old lady's farmhouse, rolled down the window and asked for a cup of coffee. Uh, the only logical thing, you know, anyone here ever drink and drive, you know? Uh, and then the other thing he did was he got a little, he got a little drunk. And you know, you get a couple beers in and you get a little projecty. It's like, I'm a, I'm a DUI, I'm a DIY. You know what I mean? I'm a, I'm a just doing things. So he paints 
And I'm telling this story how it happens in my mind, not how it necessarily fully happened in reality. Uh, that he gets part of the part of the uh, house painted, not even all of it. And he's like, oh, it looks so good. And then some birds show up and birds do the things that birds do, which is poop. And he does the only reasonable, logical thing that anyone could do in this sort of situation, which is get a shotgun. And I just love the idea that he's pointing his shotgun at these birds and he's going to shoot them. He's drunk out of his mind. I'm assuming he, he is missing and then taking chunks out of the house that he's like, I painted, don't mess my paint. And just boom. And it is, again, rural Vermont in the 1930s. That's not cool. So he's, he's, got, he's gotten himself into some legal hot water. And while he's standing on trial, Roland Hazard shows up. And Roland Hazard, you know, is like, hey, can, can we let him off for me, you know? And uh, he, he knew have a friend of his, Seba Graves, his father was the judge, and, and, and Abby, Abby Thatcher didn't have great motives. He doesn't want to go to jail. And so he worked, but he has the, he worked the, the course of action or takes some of the course of action, and, and he has the information about what our solution is and what our program of action is. And Bill Wilson, drunk in his kitchen, probably wasn't in his kitchen, uh, but he was sitting there drunk, and Abby Thatcher shows up, fresh skin glowing, and he carries the message of what our solution is, the spiritual awakening and the program of action, which is the 12 steps. And he carries that message to Bill Wilson. And in that moment, Bill Wilson has the three pieces of information that I need in order to stay sober. It is that simple. I need to understand what my problem is. I need to understand what the solution is. And I need to know how to get there. And I love that it's he acquired the ideas but that he is going to put them into like practical application. And then as it talks about his part, so I don't need the screen share anymore. Woo. Uh, if anyone wants that thing, I'll throw it in uh, some of the WhatsApp chats and I'll throw it into the chat. Um, but it's also like as part of his rehabilitation, he commenced to present his conception to other alcoholics impressing upon them that they must do likewise with still others. What does that mean? 12 step work, 12 step work. Man, we haven't even gotten to the physical allergy yet. And what is he saying? He's saying to stay sober. But Wilson had to work with others. I need to work with others. Working with others is a part of this deal. And if you're here today and you're scared to work with others, you haven't sponsored, you don't know how, and I'm talking about it and how important it is, and you get a little twisty and resisty, you know, you get the knot in your stomach and you're like, oh, you know, twisty, resisty. What I want you to know is our, at least my hope, but I'm sure it's Terry's too. Uh, my hope is that we, that we, yeah, that we can help you be more comfortable in sponsoring, more comfortable in working with others. You know, for me, the, the purpose of this is not just to convey this information so you have an experience, which I hope you do, but it is so that you can then help others have an experience. That's what, that's what I'm after. And I think it's what Terry's after too. Pew, pew. Uh, and yeah, I love it. Like, have I, as, as Terry was saying, have I tried other methods? Have they failed completely? Have the methods I've tried failed? Because if you don't have anything better to do on a Friday night, then listen to me read the dictionary, and then Terry provide very helpful information. <laughs> you might just be of the hopeless variety. Um, did you wanna? Did you wanna take the next paragraph? Did you want me to read? Pew pew. It's up to you. Pew pew. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just thinking, and I mean, and and, and that story that you said with Abby to Bill. It, is, there's Dr. Bob. Dr. Bob had the solution, but he didn't understand the problem. Step one is all about, it's designed to smash you, right? The first step of getting out of jail is knowing that you're in jail in the first place. These pages are designed to beat you up. Like, damn, that's me. Damn, I drank like that. Damn, you know, it is designed to do that, right? So these facts, I, I like that word fact. I like to collect facts, in this book, and the definition of fact means proven to be true, appear to be of extreme medical importance because of the extraordinary possibilities of the rapid growth inherent in this group. They may mark a new epoch in the annals of alcoholism. I didn't, under, I didn't really realize the doctor. He's a kinky doctor. He's talking about anal. And, <laughs> oops, oops. <laughs> I think Epoch, oh, there's two kids here. I got one over here as well. <laughs> My bad. Uh, so I think Epoch is what, history or records, something like that? If you could give me the definition on that. Absolutely. I think, um, yeah, I think. So epoch is an era of time. Era of time. And era an time. anno, which I'm going to say very uh, carefully, 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Anil is a uh, recorded recorded history. So gotcha. this, this, uh, yeah. So epoch era era and Anil is recorded history. Now, uh, I have if yeah. All right, I got this little metaphor. And uh, some of you guys know I'm all about the visual details. Uh, has anyone here ever seen the movie Beauty and the Beast? Whether whether it be the live action or the animated one, and if you haven't, I won't say you're missing out, but uh, oh, I wish I had like a clever line from the movie uh, that I could like, oh, you're, uh, and I got nothing. I can't remember anything. Uh, but in that movie, Beast has that library. Yeah, you know what's up. Uh, Beast has that library. And imagine that, it, and this is what the metaphor is saying. Imagine. Imagine that every book, and you know, if you're like, girl, I have not seen Beauty and the Beast. Fine, you're missing out, but imagine any beautiful library, you know, Library of Congress, or like any just um, immaculate, mute, it doesn't have to be beautiful, but it helps with the little mind pictures. Imagine this beautiful library, and every book in that library is about alcoholism, or is about drug addiction, or is about the compulsive behavior, gambling, food, sex, uh, shopping, uh, codependency, whatever brings you to this study, that is what all the books are about. And what it is saying is that every on every book and in every page, it says people like me are hopeless. I'm hopeless. I'm hopeless. I'm hopeless. I'm hopeless. Turn the page. I'm hopeless. Grab another book. Turn the page. I am hopeless. And what he's saying is a new epoch in the annals of alcoholism. It's like saying a new book. We open up this new book, page one, that there might be hope for people like us. That's that's what he's saying. And uh, just because you're relocating, I'll do the next part of the uh, paragraph. Oh, you're back. Did you want to take it? Yeah. Thanks for asking. Uh, thank you. We, we left off at uh, these these men. These men. These So these men will have a remedy for thousands of such situations. You know, this is his first statement is kind of vanilla, right? This is the second one is, is a lot where the juice is at. But, you know, the 19, I think, I don't know if the 19th, I know the definition of remedy means a cure for a disease. I remember I talked to, I, I recommended that everyone in this room read the, I forgot, the article of Alcoholics and God. And they said the word cure a lot in there. So just a fruit for thought. You may rely absolutely on anything they have to say about themselves. This is the top dog, you know, and, and Howard, correct me if I'm wrong. I think I've heard this from Steve Wood. I'll probably, probably butcher this, but his success rate was what? 1% before we met Bill. Is that, uh, am I close or am I off? Uh, maybe it was zero. So maybe the 1% came from the non-alcoholics that came to treatment, you know, rehabs, Rehabs have a purpose, you know, if, you, if someone is a, has a DUI or two DUIs, they, they get pain, humiliation, pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization. They, you know, they hit a rock bottom and they go to rehab and they don't drink and go to meetings and they could stay sober for the rest of their life. That's probably maybe the experience that my boy Silky had with non-alcoholics. But what about the real alcohol? This cat had a very low, 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 probably zero to 1% success ratio until he met Bill. And then he's literally watching this cat tell his story to other cats in, in, this, in this hospital, town's hospital, and he's watching them recover. This is probably the most successful treatment for alcohols in the last 5,000 years, right? And if, you really, if you really think about it, right? And remember, he is the top dog, the top dog in the United States helping with alcoholic and drug addicts, right? And he's saying you may absolutely rely on anything they have to say about themselves. What a statement. Now, and I, this is my personal opinion. Alcoholics Anonymous comes in with a, a, with a statement afterwards saying, basically, come on, give us some more stuff. <laughs> come on, this is vanilla, the first statement, right? And, and he didn't sign it the first time, right? And, you know, in this fourth edition, it says, William... His middle name is Duncan Silkwood. So, and the page back over to you, pew, pew, pew. Pew, pew, pew. Duncan and Throck Morton. Woo! I don't, I'm like this. All righty. So, 
one of the things that I just want to talk about when it says you may rely absolutely on anything they say about themselves. I, I don't know about you, but that is an incredible statement. That, but it's not like to me how I'm reading it. And that's, I guess, what matters because uh, you can read it your own way. And you'd be like, it's gross, Paige. I'm not listening. Uh, that's fair. Uh, <laughs> but how I'm reading it is Dr. Silkworth's faith, but not in Bill, not in Fitzmail. Fitzmail, he's my homie. Not in Dr. Bob, not in some of these early. Yeah, not in some of those early uh, AA members. Because I don't think that's who his faith is in. When he says you can rely absolutely anything they say about themselves. I mean, I think he's talking about us. Because he's it, like, as this book would go out into the world, there would be more and more people who are recovered alcoholics. And whether, whether that is true or not, it helps me to see the ideal that which I can live up to. The Dr. William D. Silkworth, there's not a chance he would have met me because our, our lives did not cross. He died in the 50s. Uh, and would he have liked me? Probably not. Uh, and that's okay. Uh, but like, but like, that's what he's saying. It's like, you can rely absolutely on anything that Paige says about herself about her alcoholism, about her recovery from alcoholism, about her drug addiction, about her about her, about the spiritual awakenings that she has had. You can rely on what Paige says about herself. And that is not his belief in me. He doesn't know me. That is the belief in the power of God in these 12 steps. The program of action and the solution that was that he was seeing take fire in these early members. Uh, I'm also pretty reliable about birds. Uh, just if you're wondering, like, bird, I got bird facts, I got etymology, reasonably reliable on those, but don't, you don't have to take my word for it, <laughs> or Dr. Silkworth on that one. <laughs> Did you want to take the next paragraph? Did you want me to go? It's up yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah, I mean, another profound statement, right, the sentence right below, the remedy for thousands of such situations. I mean, think about that, in this you know, welcome back to the land of the living when you get sober and we handle situations with grace. We have peace and during tremendous storms. I mean, how pretty profound. I don't know, that, that line just hit me. But All right, so here's AA talking. The physician who, Dr. Silkworth, at our request, gave us this letter, had been so kind enough and to enlarge upon his views in another statement, which followed. Come on, buddy. <laughs> Give us some more juice to talk, you know. Help us out, buddy. In this statement, he confirms that we who have suffered alcoholic torture must believe. That's a statement. Put a question mark after that. Did I suffer from alcoholic torture? <laughs> yeah, I did. Man. Remember, this book is now talking to me when I do that. The body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as his mind. So we are really looking at the physical part of this, right? It, which is the, uh, uh, did not satisfy us to be told that we could not control our drinking just because we were maladjusted to life. Put a question mark after that. Was I, put a was I question mark, was I maladjusted to life? No. <laughs> I'm sober now, Paige. I'm maladjusted to life. Uh, that we were in full flight from reality. I'm not living on planet Pluto. Put a question mark after that. Was I in full flight from reality? No. I'm sober right now. I'm good. I have a son chilling right here. I pay my bills. I got a bill right here. I'm taking care of business, right? Uh, or here, or was I outright mental defective? No, I'm not cuckoo for cocoa puffs over here. I had a, I had a sponsor who who gave me the lay aside prayer, the set aside prayer we said in the beginning, and I need to lay aside and set aside everything I think I know about dot dot dot, so I may have an open mind, new experience with everything. Why? Because I think I know everything. I'm coming in here. I think I, I can't differentiate the truth from the false. I'm living in self-delusion. I read this and I'm like, that ain't me. That ain't me. That ain't me. Well, ask yourself, when you were drinking, were you maladjusted to life? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, look, honestly, look at that. Was I, when I was drinking, was I in full flight from reality? Yes, I was chilling in planet Pluto, Tage. <laughs> right? I was out there. Right. And was I when I was drinking, was I outright mental defective? Hell yes. 
Hell yeah. All right. Yet again, taking statements, turning them into questions, making this book talk specifically to you and using good sponsorship to help guide you through this process. So these from, uh, so these were true to some extent, <laughs> to some extent, that's all. In fact, there's another fact. I like to collect facts. That's fact number two. To a considerable extent with some of us, I'm one of the considerable extents, but we are sure that our bodies were sickened as well. In our belief, any picture of the alcoholic or the drug addict which leaves out this physical factor is incomplete. And I love how the next sentence talks about the allergy. AA is actually introducing the allergy before the doctor does, right? <laughs> you know, they're telling us that there's a physical component to that. Actually, Dr. Bob didn't know. He didn't know about this. He had God. He had this, this, the six tenants and all that stuff you should talk about. He had the solution, but he didn't know what his problem was. Now, is, am I an alcoholic or am I an addict or am I both or am I neither? This is a kind of a, a theme that we're going to look in throughout this process. And the doctor's opinion, the next doctor, Dr. Carl Young, and the doctor after that, Percy Pollock, they all have one thing in common. They tell us we're screwed. <laughs> that, that's what they say. Yet again, it's designed to smash you. But the first step in getting out of jail is knowing that I'm in jail in the first place. And we're going to really look at the physical factor of it. Do I have this allergy to alcohol or do I not? Do I have this allergy to cocaine or do I not? Or do I have the allergy to both cocaine and alcohol? Or do I have neither of this? Am I a real alcoholic or am I an addict or am I both or am I neither? That's going to be the trend that I'm going to go through the first uh 40 pages with you guys. So I hope you enjoy the journey. Pew, 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 pew. Back over you, Vinny. Pew, pew, pew. I was looking up the definition of abnormal, uh, and I was looking at it, and I was like, make sure I don't lose that. And then now I cannot find it. But essentially, to summarize, not to quote, because I'm not going to waste time trying to find it again, uh, to, to be abnormal, there was some element of it which was a little appropriate for me, uh, but it's that divergent from what is standard. Now, I just really quickly before I dive into this paragraph, there's a question in the chat. Uh, and, and Howard has answered it, but just to, for anyone that's like wondering, uh, it's the question was essentially like, okay, so did Carl Jung tell Roland Hazard that he couldn't, could, did Carl Jung say, I can't help you, you're an alcoholic? And that you needed a spiritual awakening. And yes, that is essentially what he said. You'll see it on uh, page 26 to the bottom of 26, top of 27. Um, this is what you need. And he was saying, like, you need a spiritual awakening. I was trying to produce some such emotional rearrangements with you. But with people like you, alcoholics, I have never been successful. So he's saying, like, you got the mind of a chronic alcoholic. I've never seen one case recover. So he's saying like, dude, you're hopeless. And dude, your solution is a spiritual awakening. And we see that 26, 27. And uh, uh, Howard's got 27, four as the page and paragraph to point right to that. So uh, one of the things is when he talks about like, well, we who have suffered alcoholic torture must believe. And as Terry says, put a quote, have I suffered? And what is my experience that the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as his mind, that how I physiologically respond and react for me to alcohol, to drugs. But again, if you're, if you're uh, somebody that's here for things like gambling or sex or food or shopping or codependency, we're still talking about an abnormal reaction that happens when I ingest it. An abnormal reaction that happens when I engage in that addictive behavior, when I engage in that, like I'm just, I'm just trying to broaden the scope if you're here for something that's not drugs or alcohol, like to this all-inclusive study. What happens once I take a drink? What happens once I, once I take a hoot of crack? What happens once I pop a pill? And what happens when I engage in those addictive behaviors that maybe aren't a substance? And what it's saying when it says the body of the alcoholic is quite as abnormal as his mind, we're pointing to, and we're and in the next paragraph, we're going to dive on in to that physical allergy. And just real quickly, what it looks like for me is once I start, I cannot stop. 
that thing that once I start, I need more. And when we look at that word abnormal, we might get tripped up. Some of you are not tripped up and are like, Paige, yes, when you talk about you being abnormal, the shoe fits. You know, you're talking about uh, um, Beauty and the Beast. Now you're talking about Cinderella. You got that glass slipper of abnormality. I'm rocking and rolling in my evening pumpkin of uh, outright mental defective. And, uh, you know, uh, and I can't remember what else happens in Cinderella. Uh, but there's some stuff. And like, the, but what are we talking about? What happens to me once I start to drink, once I start to use, once I start to engage in that addictive behavior, is that what happens to most people? Or is it a departure from what seems to be normal? Normal is not right or better. Normal is just the majority. So for me, it's once I start, I cannot stop and I need more. And more often than not, like the more I drink, the more I use, the more I do whatever, the more I need. And it's saying like, fair enough, there's homies like Paige, who definitely outright mental defective. You know, her, her stuff is not in the group. She does not have it together. But, but if all we focus on is my outright mental defective, my uh, qualifications for the Lunacy Commission, we are missing an important part of this thing. I need to understand the physical allergy, any talk about this hopeless condition, any talk about alcoholism or whatever the illness that brings you to this study is, whatever that is, it is incomplete if we do not talk about the physical allergy. And that's what we're going to do in this next paragraph. Pew pew, over to Terry. Pew pew. <laughs> pew pew. All right, the doctor's theory. Uh, which I believe became a medical fact in like 1955, right? That we have an allergy. And there he is explaining the allergy before the doctor does. To alcohol, yeah, to alcohol interests us. So I, I was given the, the definition of allergy as an abnormal reaction to food, beverage, or substance. I believe the, uh, the current uh, uh, definition of allergy means the abnormal reaction to the harmful uh, effects of food, beverage, and substance. So I think, I believe it's changed. Uh, but what they're talking about is when I drink, I get thirsty. When I use, I want more. You know, when I gamble, I, I gamble more. I just can't, I can't stop, right? And as layman, our opinion, as it's to its soundness, of course, may mean little. But as ex palm drinkers or users or gamblers, we could say that this explanation makes good sense. It, the allergy, explains many things for which we cannot otherwise account. Like explain how I ended up in different states when I drank. <laughs> you know, it explained how I accidentally got drunk all the time. And it explained that when I took one, it took me. You know, it's like I got a friend in, in California. It's like having sex with a gorilla, but you can <laughs> the sex doesn't stop until the gorilla stops, right? You know, so it, it very similar. When I take something, it takes me. Right. And explain so many things that I couldn't never explain before because I was looking at it through different. I was looking at all the what is it called? The, the symptoms, you could say. I was looking at the consequences that were happening to me, the DUIs, the rehabs and this. And I thought that was making me the alcoholic. No, they were talking about the physical and medical powerlessness of alcoholism. Right. And, and, I, and I wanted to mention when we get to the second statement and, and the trend throughout his, the rest of this opinion, you're going to notice that good writers don't capitalize words in the middle of sentences, right? <laughs> and you're also going to, you're going to notice that good writers don't repeat themselves as well. So I want you guys to kind of take note of that. Look at all the capitalizations when you guys want to read forward. I, I, I said this was homework for people that did this last week. Just highlight anything that just stands out to you, that makes sense to you, that you like. There's no right or wrong answers, but look for the trends. Look for some repeats and look for the capital words. And we're going to be talking about that a lot. Paige, back over to you. Pew, 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 pew. Pew, pew, pew. And one of the things is we got a question in the chat, which says, what do you think of the non-diseased model versions of addiction? And I think the question is actually answered in what we just read. So I wanted to make sure I address that. And, and so what, what did we just read? It said, when it talks about his layman, listen, I'm not an immunologist. To be an immunologist is the person that studies allergies. I had a sponsee tell me that. 
uh, cause I don't know what doctors do, uh, you know, but, uh, an immunologist is somebody, that, so I'm not, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a, I'm not an expert on allergies, but when, thank you. Uh, my nephew came down and said, you're pretty cool. As he was like flinging around a shark, uh, and then ran upstairs. Uh, I just want you to know, I think the attention, uh, deficit, uh, I come by it honestly. <laughs> it could be a family trait. Uh, but uh, but when it says, so I'm not a doctor, I'm not a, a, a scientist, but when it says his explanation makes good sense, it explains many things for which we cannot otherwise account. What I can, I cannot speak to other models. I don't know all the other models. I don't know all the other different ways to look at addiction or alcoholism. But what I can say is when this description of what it means to be an alcoholic, this description of what it means to be an addict was explained to me, man, it pegged me between the eyes. Oh, that's me. Oh, that's me. There was no further authentication necessary. Now I'm saying this to somebody who fought the process and I'm like, I'm different. I'm not like you. And they'd, you know, throw out DUIs. I'm like, I don't drive, you know, and I'd be, they'd be like divorces. I'm like not functional enough to get married. And I'd be trying to dodge all the consequences. By the way, the actual consequences couldn't dodge, but I would try to dodge the consequences. But when I heard the allergy, oh, I once once I start, I can't stop. That's me. When I heard about the obsession, I desperately don't want to do it again. And I find that I do it again. I have a thought that happens when I'm sober that takes me back again and again. Oh, that's me. And not diagnostic of alcoholism, not diagnostic of addiction. I will point out when I heard of the spiritual malady, it was helpful to know. It was helpful to know that when I got sober, I got worse. And that was not my andas. You know, I'm an alcoholic and I'm an addict and that was a part of this thing. And uh, I have, not only do I have a 1930s dictionary, I got a 1930s medical dictionary because I am fun at parties. Woo! And so I, I have uh, the, uh, the 1930s definition of allergy, which is a natural hypersensitivity to an artificially induced substance, which is, I think a substance like alcohol, like crack, like pills, and I am sensitive to that. And what that looks like is I need more. And man, it, it explains things that I, I could not otherwise understand. Now, we have a minute left. Do you want to wrap it up yeah. there? Like try no, to... let's finish it. Let's finish oh, it. Power. Let's finish yeah. it. We're going over. Uh, pew, pew, pew. <laughs> All right, I'll get going. So we work out our solution on the spiritual as well as altruistic plane. Altruistic is just helping others. I mean, if you come in, anyone here that this is a selfish program? Anyone here that? <laughs> no, it's, it's an altruistic help, uh, program. It's helping others so that I could get out of the way so that God could work his magic program. That's the deal. It's all about you and helping you. All right. Uh, uh, where was it? We favor hospitalization for the alky or the addict who is very jittery or befogged. More often than not, it is imperative. Uh, super important. I don't know the definition of that, but imperative that a man's or woman's brain be cleared before he is approached. There's that word approach. We talked about that earlier when we were we were talking earlier about it, right? We don't go and give people their our phone numbers. We get theirs. We approach them. Right, we approach them armed with the facts. Right, uh, blah, 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 as he has a better chance of understanding and accepting what we have to offer. Anyone remember that their first day one or day two? <laughs> you know, you know. Imagine if you were approached on day one or day two, like I'm not listening. To this is my language. I'm not listening to anything because I'm listening to the story in my head. I'm probably listening to the obsession in my head. Maybe still have alcohol in my system. I still have this allergy, this phenomenon of craving that is beyond my mental control that's talking super loud in my head. I'm not hearing you. I'm not listening to you. I feel like ripping my skin off. I'm, I'm, where's the, I'm yearning for the love of my life, which is alcohol or drugs. I need it back. So it is imperative. He's going to repeat himself. The doctor, actually, the doctor didn't even talk right here, but they're going to repeat this again, saying that he, we need to be, uh, 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 what is it called, detoxed before we approach anyone or I'm approached by someone. 
So yet again, this is all that helps you guys to carry out the message to be a much more effective communicator or an effective uh, message uh, messenger to someone else is you can't help someone who is literally going through the throes of detox. It's just really difficult. Just look at your own experience. Just look at your own experience. Yep, back over to you, people. And I love that we kick it off our solution. So our solution on the spiritual. So our solution is a spiritual awakening, but it doesn't say that's a solution, period. It says, as well as the altruistic plane. And as Terry said, that's help, it's helping God's kids for fun and for free. That's helping other people. What are we talking about? 12-step work. That's what we're talking about. Oh, man, what do you, you mean? You mean I got to, like, do this? And then I got to help people? Yes. Yes, we've got to sponsor others. That's this deal. And, yeah, as Terry was saying, like, I can't hear the message if I'm in, if I'm in hallucinations from uh, DTs. But I also, it can be very difficult to get momentum if I've got the throes of the allergy on me. So there are times if we're working with a sponsee and it's like, oh, they're not willing. Heck, they might not be detox. I have a sponsee just now and she's trying to work with somebody and she's like, I keep smelling alcohol on her breath. And I'm like, I think the conversation might need to be detox. Because if she's still drinking, she might not be able to hear what you're saying. And yeah, as Howard put in the chat, the next the next uh, statement was technically a letter. It's a statement. Um, but why don't we wrap it up there and we'll pick up the second statement next week and we'll dive further into the allergy, breaking it down, talking about it and some just exciting stuff. So uh, what, if you're all good, I'll stop the recording and we can wrap it up with a prayer. How's that sound? Yeah, pew, 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 pew. Pew, pew, pew. <laughs>